So as you know, they pay me to do this job. So technically, I'm a pro. A pro at keeping you clones in line and a pro at interviewing the right people in sports. Well, here is some simple advice from a pro that can help you out. When you're looking for pro tips on vehicle maintenance or repair, look no further than O'Reilly Auto Parts. When it comes to replacing your battery, getting advice on proper car maintenance, or even just getting the best bang for your buck, their expert team can help you out every step of the way. O'Reilly Auto Parts. Better parts, better prices every day. I disagree with Paul Jarrett. I think that was a very good shot because he had made like five of them before he shot that one. That was a great shot. Yeah. You got to tip your hat, right? His name's Logo. (laughs) (laughs) He took his shot that he's named after, essentially. (laughs) What are you talking about? Welcome to the Jim Rome Podcast. This is F81, and my guest is actor, writer, and director Bill Hader. Bill is the co-creator and star, plus the writer and director and producer of HBO's Smash Barry. He's an SNL legend with characters like Stefan, Devin from the Californians, and Dateline's Keith Morrison. He's a leading man in movies like Trainwreck and the upcoming It, Chapter 2, and he joins the pod as the season finale of Barry airs this Sunday night on HBO. This is a great TV show. It's funny, it's violent, it's dark, it's awesome. It deserves all the awards that it's won so far. And in the middle of a busy week, Bill was kind enough to stop by and chop it up for the pod. Ep 81 with Bill Hader gets started right now. This is a story of the first time I ever felt a sense of purpose. This is a story of the first time I took a life. What I do is not who I am. There is inherent darkness in you. Am I evil? Like an evil person? Yes, you are like the most evil, badass person I know. Do I not tell you that enough? So, Bill, we are gearing up for the season finale of Barry, and I think a lot of folks are pumped for that. But, Bill, for those who may know your work from SNL and your movies but have not seen this show, first off, who is Barry, and what is Barry like? Oh, uh, well, he's a former Marine that um, works as a well, he works as a hitman, and he's kind of dissatisfied in his life, so he decides to. Um, He tails a guy that he's supposed to kill to uh, Los Angeles, and he ends up following him to his acting class, and he decides to take the class. And, And that's basically, it's just about a guy trying to find community and like a guy trying to, you know, um, I don't know, just, he kind of inherently knows something's wrong with him. So he works with this acting class and the acting teacher played by Henry Winkler and they're trying to, uh, and he's trying to, you know, he's almost using it as therapy. Now, the show, the show is really funny, but the show is dark. It's very dark. So given who you are and what you had done previously, what was the initial reaction of fans when they realized what this show was, or maybe more importantly, what the show wasn't? Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's true. It's it's not at all. I think when people heard that premise, I think they thought, oh, it'll be kind of like a funny kind of light show with murder in it or something. But uh, no, we take it pretty seriously, and it's very dark. Um, but I think, uh, I don't know, we just try to treat it real. Um, but I, I was surprised. It was a bit, I, I thought, oh, this is going to lose a lot of people, but I was surprised how much people enjoyed it <laughs> i mean for sure it's not what they expected but i mean as an artist you want to do that right you want to reach you want to reach so like where did the idea come from I mean, inherently you're not a violent person farthest thing from it so how did you come to create this character and then what's it like playing barry uh well alec berg and i came up with it um he's a co-creator and he works on silicon valley and curvy enthusiasm and he was right on seinfeld forever and he's uh amazing and we we just I don't know. We, we, neither of us are very violent people, but we, I understood the idea of wanting a community, which is what the guy wants, and wanting to feel like uh, kind of accepted. And I think his work has made him kind of isolated from uh, humanity, so he's trying to find a way in. And then playing Barry, to be honest, because I'm 
you know, producing and writing and directing and uh, all the and show running and all these things, the acting is kind of the last thing I think about. It's kind of, you know, like, oh, right, I got to get on my mark and be in the scene. In a weird way, that kind of helps because you're just running on instinct. I think when I have too much time on my hands, I kind of over prepare it maybe or I think about it too much in my head at least. And it uh, doesn't, it's not as, as spontaneous or, or real. Bill, I think that's that's really interesting what you just said to me because you're right. You're not just acting. You are the co-creator. You write it. You star in it. You're a showrunner, and you don't want to overthink it or put too much on it. But the fact is you're involved in every aspect of it. You ever think to yourself, like, whether or not this thing works is pretty much going to come down to me? And if so, do you like that feeling? Yeah, I mean, it's like it's a thing that comes with wanting to have your own thing 100%, you know, and you just got to be like, I don't know, you have to just make sure it's something that you like, you know, and it's like, well, this is a thing I want to go see, you know, and work really hard. But that being your, you know, your North Star in a way of just like that's it's just this is what Alec and Alec Berg and I want to see. And um, and hopefully that means other people want to see it. But, you know, it's the thing I learned at Saturday Night Live, which is, you know, if you have a sketch, it's better to kind of fail on your own than fail with someone else's mistakes. That makes sense to me. All right, so the season finale is coming up, and HBO has already picked up season three. I'm kind of curious how the process works. I mean, have you given, you and Alec, have you given thought to season three? And if so, what would that look like? Um, we have no idea what season three is. <laughs> <laughs> right? We have no idea. He's working on Silicon Valley right now, so I think if I said, hey, man, what do you think about this for season three? His head would explode. So, <laughs> um, But usually, yeah, this is, you know, I need. I'm, I just did it to the sequel to it, so I'm. I, I'm. I'm. You know, we're both very busy, and I think we both just need a bit of a break from Barry for a couple of months before we, so we can come in a bit fresh. I got that. Listen, I'm going to ask you about it in one second. You mentioned SNL. You know, you have one of those great stories where you dropped out of college, you moved here to Los Angeles to take a shot in the business back in 1999. I mean, did it seem like the normal thing to do back then, or what was that like to take that big shot? Um, you know, it wasn't as scary as I, you would think it would be. It was kind of just, it was just something that I thought was the right, it just, uh, the right, I, well, I kind of, to be honest, I had no choice and I was lucky enough that my parents had a college fund for me that I just, instead of using it for school, I was going to use it to just live on, you know? Um, so, it, but you know, it's kind of like Barry, you know, you, I met a, like a community of people and a bunch of like-minded people and we were all trying to do the same thing and I don't know, it was fun, but uh, I don't know, I enjoy it, you know, it's like, you know, it was hard, it was definitely hard, but, and there wasn't a lot of money or anything, but it was, you know, I had a blast. Yeah, I think you're right. Like, I don't want to compare. I mean, why would any of us compare any of our situations? But I agree with you. Like, when I got started in the business and had nothing, it just seemed like that's what you were supposed to do. Now I look back, I'm like, what the fuck was I thinking? But luckily, yeah, exactly. Like, luckily, it worked out. But I'm, okay, like, so you had some money from your college fund, but you still had to make ends meet. Like, what were the things that you did when you first got here to pay the bills? What kind of jobs did oh, you I have? Was a, I was a production assistant on a lot of movies, like super low-budget movies and – you know, and then big budget movies like Collateral Damage with Arnold Schwarzenegger and uh, Scorpion King with The Rock. And then I was also a stage manager on this Playboy show called Night Calls for like a week. Not stage manager. I was a PA on the stage. So I just had to, that was, you know, one thing I did. <laughs> well, yeah, it's funny <laughs> you say I worked I, on a Lifetime show. Let me ask you about it. So if you were only there a week, maybe it wouldn't register. But did you know a guy, when you worked at Playboy, did you know a guy named Jamie Batista? No, I don't. Uh, my time. I don't know. No, doesn't strike a bell. Yeah, I, I don't know. He was the stage manager of my first sports show for ESPN two, and got a job there. Hey man, that, that would have oh, been a big hilarious. swing. I swing and oh, I miss. Man. I tried, Bill. I tried. No, 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 no. But man, dude, it it was. I was just not. It was just not for me. <laughs> 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 my friends were like, "Oh man, that's rad, right?" And I'm like, "No." No. <laughs> you mean, that's not why you that's not why you dropped out of school to come out here to work for Playboy yeah, TV. Yeah, I don't want to. Yeah, do your it. friends are like, yeah. dude, you're killing it. This is it's the dream yeah. come true. 
you're crazy. Why are you walking away from a show, job on Playboy? I'm like, it's just making me feel bad. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, you really quick. So you had this amazing run on Saturday Night Live, but the story of how you got to Lauren Michaels initially, I mean, those who know you know the story, but not everybody does. Can you just tell that story? How did that go down? How did you get to Lauren Michaels initially? Uh, Megan Mullally. Megan Mullally saw me on a, in a show uh, that her brother-in-law was in, and she recommended me. Uh, she said, oh, Lauren, you should meet him. And I went and met him. And no, it was really, I mean, it was, it was crazy. It was really cool. And then, uh, I met him and we just had it. I mean, he liked what, you know, what I did in the show and I got an audition and ended up getting the show. But if, yeah, if it wasn't for Megan Mullally, I wouldn't have a career. You know, it's an amazing gig, but it's a really intense gig, a nerve wracking gig. Like, how much of a toll did the first few seasons take on you? What were those years like? Well, all of it was really hard. I mean, I had pretty bad anxiety pretty much the entire time I was there. Um, just, you know, the live aspect of it. It really was just the live aspect of it was really nerve wracking for me. And it was always something that I was trying to work through. But, um, yeah, but the first couple of years was really hard because you just never know if you're going to be fired or not, you know. And then Lauren Michaels told me, like, after my fourth season, hey, you know, you could work here as long as you want. I think he said that to get me to calm down. And I did to a degree, but I still, on the live shows, was very, very nervous. You know, did you ultimately work through that, get beyond that? Or, frankly, did it only kind of improve when you moved on to other stuff? I mean, it kind of, it was just a live aspect. It was just like once the show got going, I kind of calmed down a little bit. But, man, it was pretty hard. Um, but, no, it never really, it never really went away. No, it was it was always a battle. And then I started laughing a lot in sketches, I think, towards the end because I was just so nervous. And it was I'm just a soft touch because I'm so keyed up that I, I laugh easily. So I think people were... Between Kenan Thompson and Fred and John Mulaney, when we do stuff on, he would write stuff I hadn't seen and, you know, stuff like that. No, I know, right? Like, I remember I remember a guy, a really prominent TV producer once said to me, I came off the set for one of my first TV shows, and he's like, hey, man, why don't you relax, man? Have a shot of bourbon or something. And I think to myself, I'm trying to slow myself down, and you want to relax, but how do you just relax? What kind of advice is that? Relax. Yeah, that's like, yeah, that's like saying someone who's on fire, hey, just don't be on fire. Right. You know, and you're like, no, that, that, that's not how this works. <laughs> right. I, I mean, it'd be great. Yeah. So, like, when you went back, yeah. so you've gone back a couple of times to host, guest host since then. Did that same thing kind of come back, or was it different? What oh, was it like to host yeah, it? 100%. Hmm. 100%. If not, if not worse, because you're in almost everything. So, <laughs> right. yeah, I was very nervous. I remember Lauren, last time I hosted, came down to my dressing room and was just, will you please try to have fun? <laughs> And I was like, I I do once it's rolling. It's just the anticipation of it makes me just want to just crawl into a hole, you know? Right. No, I do. I actually I get that on some level for sure. So, yeah. But but you but you've always had this great love of film. Where did that come from? Uh, my my parents pretty much. I mean, they they loved watching. We we were definitely like a, we didn't really watch a lot of TV like TV shows. It was almost always movies and uh, old movies and and things like that. And so I just watched a ton of movies and then got, because of my dad and especially, like, a pretty sophisticated taste at a young age, you know, I was watching, uh, you know, like, I remember seeing, you know, Stanley Kubrick movies at a really young age and Altman and all these things. And, and my mom always had it, had AMC on, which would play all the old movies. So I just, um, just always fascinated by it and just very genuinely love it. I still am that way. I still, you know, last night was watching this movie, the hitchhiker that Ida Lapito directed in like the forties with Edmund O'Brien in it. And I was like, this is amazing. You know, it's just, I love finding new, new, uh, new movies, you know, Contractors can rely on Ferguson to provide a winning game plan for any job, any day. Thanks to their pro pickup service, you can choose from thousands of products to order online and pick up in store, which makes doing business with Ferguson the easiest part of your day.
Remember the first time, and I know you've seen this, Taxi Driver with Robert De Niro. Oh, yeah. I thought that was intense. Yeah. Like, did that have kind of an effect on you as well? Like, did that movie resonate with you when you first saw it? Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, I, uh, my whole, I, it was like before and after seeing Taxi Driver, you know. And, I mean, Barry, I think, owes a lot to Taxi Driver, and it's so funny. It's so ingrained in me that I don't notice it until after it's done, and then you're in an interview, and someone goes, oh, this kind of reminds me of Taxi Driver, and you go, oh, like, well, of course, yeah, it's like one of my favorite movies. Um, so, uh, yeah, yeah, no, 100%. That movie had a massive effect on me, the way it was filmed and uh, and the performances, how everyone's acting in that movie, and it's all none of it's pushed. It's all very natural, and it just feels very real, which I like. Real, for sure. Now, Bill, before you go, a couple of things you mentioned, Henry Winkler, and, of course, he is with you on Barry. I mean, I got to ask, is there a better guy in this town than Henry no. Winkler? No, better yet. Is there a better guy on this planet than Henry Winkler? No. No, he's the nicest human being on the planet. He's so sweet. He's the nicest guy in the world. And, you know, after every episode, he texts me a nice, sweet text saying, like, oh, man, it was just, do you see what you did? Like, that was amazing. And this performance by this person. And it doesn't matter how, who the actor is, even if it's a young day player and it's their first job, he'll go over and go, I love that thing you just did where you came in and you said, you know, and they'll have like two lines. He'll go, those parts are so hard, the two line parts, and you just made that work and blah, blah, You know, he's he's so sweet. Well, like Bill, like he he's an acting coach on the show, but he's an acting coach off the show. And most importantly, it's genuine, man. It's real, right? He means it. Yeah. Yeah, no. Yeah, he really means it. He's just so, and uh, just all love. He's just like all love all the time. It's very sweet. All right, now, It, before you go, It, Chapter 2 is coming out in September, and this, to me, seems like a completely different animal altogether. What do you like about this project, and why did you want to take that on? Well, I like the first movie, and um, I like the direction in it. I met Andy Machete, the director, and I got along with him great. And his sister, Barbara, is his producing partner, and she's fantastic and a great person. And I just was like, man, let's... uh, I want to work with these guys. And then when they put this amazing cast together, um, I just, yeah, it was a blast. And I'd never done a horror movie, and I, I like horror movies, uh, especially old horror movies. Um, so uh, it was just fun. It was just a blast, you know. Hey, Bill, you and Bill told- Sarsgaard plays Pennywise is unreal. Uh-huh. He's, just, what a, he's just phenomenal, yeah. Now, you told Conan recently, yeah, but the only thing is I, I can't really act scared. So you're in a horror no. flick, a really scary flick. How do you dress that? No, I don't. I don't know how to do it because my problem is when I get nervous or scared, I'm like I laugh, I <laughs> smile. <laughs> so they're always like, "Dude, what are you doing, man?" <laughs> Got to be scared, and I just have a big smile on my face. I'm like, I am scared. Um, so what yeah. Mean, what do you mean? Work. What am I doing? I'm scared shitless. Can't you tell? I'm scared. Look at me, guys. Look at me, man. And I just have like this big smile on my face. Like, are you stoned? <laughs> All right, so you did a, a sports podcast right here, so i got to hit you with one sports question on the way out the door. You are from Tulsa. The pro team in town, mm-hmm. obviously, is the OKC Thunder. You're a fan, but the story goes it took an infection and some steroids for you to become that fan. <laughs> What's the story behind that? That was kind of a joke I did on Kimmel where I went, like, I, be, I was on uh, prednisone, and I became, like, rabid OKC Thunder fan, like, bought tickets. <laughs> even though I lived in LA and like bought all this stuff, like just all my energy went into OKC Thunder. And then it was like, I went off prednisone. I was like, I can't go to Chesapeake arena. It's an Oklahoma <laughs> city. When, <laughs> when would I go there? Great. And, um, I don't have a private plane. I could fly to Oklahoma <laughs> city on the weekend. Like, what am I doing? This is insane. And, um, but no, I, I will say though, it was, uh, th- this season was tough, but that, I, my dad and I called each other immediately after that last game, and we both were like, "Say, you know, say what you will, but that that Damian Lillard shot was pretty insane." Logo was, Lillard, yeah, you mean the one that he made from the parking lot to knock you guys out? Yeah, you mean that logo, shot? Yeah, where the well, the ones he's been making all game, and then I was watching it, just yelling at Paul George. I'm like, "What are you doing? Get up on!" <laughs> <laughs> Great. I was like, "Get in his face!" But that's what he had done in the last possession, and. Logo had just buzzed right past him. So I just, I mean, yeah, it's like impossible to guard that. 
Good job, but man. I, I disagree with Paul George. I think that was a very good shot because he had made that shot. Like He had made like five of them before he shot that one. My God, I love that you just That's said that. I, I, I literally love that you just said that. I love that you remembered that because yeah, look, Paul George has been through a whole lot and he's a great player, but that's just a terrible – that's an all-time bad take. That that was a great yeah. shot. That was a great shot. Yeah. You got to tip your hat, you right? All, yeah, you just be like, that's why you call him – his name's Logo. <laughs> <laughs> he took his, his shot that he's named after, essentially. <laughs> what are you talking about? There you go. Um, hey, listen, if you ever get tired of doing this, they'd give you a talk show with takes like that. Hey, listen, in fact, in terms of the business, Barry, Barry is so great, and I promise this is the really, really the last question. Barry is so great, and you got every reason to be really, really proud of that project, but it never hurts to have a strong lead-in. What's it like having Game of Thrones leading into Barry? Oh, my God, it's it's a dream. I mean, our, we got – I saw those guys, Dan Weiss and David Benioff, at a, and I just – you know, toasted him. And I was like, hey, guys, you just gave us, like, 2.5 million new viewers. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, the the amount of people that especially watched episode five of Barry with the battle of, after the Battle of Winterfell, that was, like, insane. Yeah, it was crazy. That's super. That was three weeks ago, and the finale is coming up, and season three has already yep. been picked up. Bill, can't thank you enough. I, I really hey, appreciate you, you making man. time. See you, buddy. Fellas, I've got some free advice for you. Trust me on this one. It is never a good look when you untuck a long, bulky dress shirt. In fact, it's a terrible look. Like, you may think that it makes you look casual, but more than likely, it just ends up looking sloppy. This is why Untuck It makes shirts that are specifically designed to be worn untucked. A casual shirt that's not too long and not too short, it's just right. Shirts that are designed so well, GQ calls them, quote, perfection. Untucked shirts are a go-to for any occasion from casual to dressy. And not only do they look good, they feel amazing. I know. I wear them. Impeccable craftsmanship and attention to detail make Untuck It the only choice for the untucked man. With more than 50 sizing options, every guy can find the perfect shirt. Simply log on to UntuckIt.com. Check out all the new arrivals. Use the promo code ROAM20 and get 20% off your entire first-time purchase. You can also visit Untuck It at one of their over 50 retail locations across the country. Listen, stop hiding your shirt with your pants and your pants with your shirt, untuckit.com. Your solution to perfecting casual. Use the promo code ROAM20 and get 20% off. Always good to change it up and do something a little bit different. My thanks to Bill Hader for that conversation. And make sure you check out his show, Barry, Sunday nights on HBO. I'll be back next week with an old pal and a jungle legend, Roger Lodge. That is going to be a grip of fun. Make sure you check that out. That's episode 82 with Roger Lodge coming up next week. Now, before I get up out of here, I want to let you know. I am looking for some new blood on the voicemail. So if you can hear my voice right now, make sure you put this number in your phone. 949-385-0447. 949-385-0447. Save that. Use it anytime you want. Leave me something funny enough, weird enough, or smart enough, and I will play it back on the next podcast. Just make sure you keep it tight. 30 seconds or less. If you're wondering what a podcast-worthy voicemail sounds like, here you go, and I'll see you all next week. First new message. Hey, uh, Jim. It's uh, Bob Kraft again. I just wanted to say hi and uh, let you know. Finally glad all that situation down in uh, Florida is kind of clearing up because there's nothing worse than something like that blowing up in your face. I know a lot of people think me, I'm just a football guy, but I really love baseball and basketball too. I, although I used to like basketball more when they had hand checking in it, but hockey has got to be one of my favorites because there's nothing better than a good slap shot and even better a good wrist shot. I'll talk to you later. Bye-bye. Message deleted. Next message. Tim, FBI Mike. Hey, why did Beaks in Studio City cross the road? To get to Golden Corral, because he's fat! Message deleted. Next message. Hey, Jim, what's going on? This is David from Buffalo calling in with a prediction for the PGA Championship. Brooks freaking... Kepka. This guy is going to come back at the PGA and he's going to win it. Jim, I'll see you next week. I'm out. Message saved. Next message. Vance Smiggity, your boy Matt in LA. There's a 30 plus 
year Laker fan, a 43-year-old man. First time in my life, I'm embarrassed to be a Laker fan. A collection of ass clowns that was down at LA Live or downtown LA or wherever the hell they were. Memo to these idiot millennial Laker fans. Nobody's listening to you. You got a bunch of dumbasses. Message saved. You have no more messages. Think about this for a minute. It takes more than hard work to make it to the pros. It also takes smarts. You know, the kind of smarts that can read a defense and pick it apart. Well, hiring is no different. You need smarts to find the right people, but you don't need to spend years honing your game. You simply need ZipRecruiter. ZipRecruiter's powerful matching technology scans thousands of resumes to find the right people with the right experience and then invites them to apply for your job. Try ZipRecruiter for free at this exclusive web address, ZipRecruiter.com slash clones. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash C-L-O-N-E-S. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire.